Education Scotland's guidelines for early reading are organised across three main areas. These are building a literacy-rich environment through interactions, experiences and spaces, developing skills for reading and building independent and engaged readers. For each of the areas pictured, a suite of videos has been developed to support professional learning. The videos have been carefully developed to align with Scotland's Curriculum for Excellence guidance. Throughout the video, some technical terms are used to describe aspects of early reading. The QR code shown on the slide will allow you to access a glossary with brief explanations of some of the terms used. Each area has been broken down into four themes. There is a video which explores each theme, identifying key messages and research which supports the guidance. This video is focused on considering interventions, as underlined on the slide. You may choose to watch this video in isolation, but it is recommended that the overall suite of videos is used to support a broader programme of professional learning. The rationale for chosen interventions should be based upon the context and needs of the child. Within this video, we will explore the following three key messages. Through dialogue with others, establish a clear understanding of specific needs, barriers, before considering an intervention. Ensure decisions around chosen interventions are informed by research or evidence and appropriate to your school context. Understand the purpose of a chosen intervention, how to implement it effectively and evaluate its impact. A list of signposted resources has been created to accompany this video. At the end of the presentation, you can return to the home page for the overall resource or a landing page which has further support for considering interventions. The EEF's Improving Literacy in Key Stage 1 Guidance Report recommends use of high quality interventions to help children who are struggling with their literacy. But what do we mean by the term intervention? What makes an intervention high quality? And how do we ensure that the intervention chosen meets the literacy needs of the child? These questions, amongst others, will be explored over the course of this video. Let's begin with what we mean by the term intervention. Intervention can have multiple meanings in an education context. However, for the purpose of this video and the context of this resource, we will consider intervention a short-term focused support in specific areas with clear objectives. It can be carried out in a small group with children who have similar needs or on a one-to-one -one basis. In some cases, these needs might be gaps in components of reading, such as decoding or fluency. However, for some children, intervention might focus on other aspects of reading, such as extending reading engagement and motivation. Children may have identified reading needs in more than one area, so we need to consider which to prioritise in terms of focused instruction. Any intervention is, by nature, short term. However, this does not mean that support cannot be extended beyond the initial time frame if progress is slower than expected. Conversely, an intervention might be shortened if educators determine that sufficient progress has been made and the focus needs to shift. The International Literacy Association advise that interventions, where appropriate, will include opportunities for regular repetition to allow concepts to be reviewed, practiced and mastered, as well as some sort of routine which is followed, allowing the children participating to focus on content instead of a changing format. This reminds us of the importance of regular repetition and consistent routines when implementing intervention. It is important to mention that within the context of this resource, intervention is not the same as the planned adaptations which an educator makes to their teaching following observation and assessment of progress. These adaptions to planning would be considered as differentiation, where an educator tailors input or instruction to meet the needs of a child, group or class. We can adapt the input, content and resources we provide to support children, enhancing accessibility and increasing their chances of success in daily teaching and learning. Differentiation within the context of teaching reading 
is explored further within the video Responsive Planning of Universal Approaches. In Christopher Such's book, The Art and Science of Teaching Primary Reading, he says, the most important, if somewhat trite point to make about any reading intervention is this, it is always better to avoid the need for intervention. Universal high quality teaching, which is differentiated and adjusted to meet the needs of children, should be our starting point. With this in place, the need for additional support should decrease. Nevertheless, some children will require additional support to enable them to make further progress in literacy through a high quality and well-considered intervention. Within the context of this video, we are discussing interventions which may take place within or out with day-to-day -day lessons as additional teaching or as a replacement for other lessons. The EEF's Improving Literacy in Key Stage 1 guidance report makes the important point that if children are withdrawn from day-to-day -day universal teaching, it is essential that the support they are given is more effective in meeting their specific needs than the teaching they would have otherwise received. The EEF highlight the risks where this is not the case, explaining if the alternative support is not more effective, it is possible for children to fall even further behind as children who remain in class may continue to make further progress. We must also take into consideration what else a child might be missing out on as a result of engaging in intervention work, as removing them from learning which they enjoy could have a negative impact on their motivation and engagement in the intervention and their education more generally. Children who are frequently taken out of class may miss important experiences which impact how they feel about themselves and school, potentially harming their sense of belonging and connection with peers. Before any intervention takes place, it is essential that the area of reading difficulty or focus is identified and understood through assessment. A school or setting might be tempted to adopt intervention where it has produced good results for a neighbouring school or a group of children in a previous year group. However, reading is a complex process, so there is not a one-size-fits-all intervention where difficulties arise. Assessing children's reading strengths barriers and needs, and then identifying an intervention with a research base is the focus of the next sections of this video. Through dialogue with others, establish a clear understanding of specific needs, barriers, before considering an intervention. This image, as discussed elsewhere in the resource, highlights possible areas of strength or need in relation to reading and the interconnection between these. Considering each of these areas will allow us to clearly understand a child's specific needs before selecting an intervention. For example, what do we know about the child's knowledge and skills of reading? That is, the five components and how they interconnect. Their phonological awareness, concepts of print and oral language skills, their background knowledge and experiences, including their reading identity, how they see themselves as a reader, the influences of their family, peers and culture, and their motivation to read, including reading for pleasure and for purpose. Researchers from many fields have concluded that children may have difficulties in any one or more of the areas needed for successful reading, and that these difficulties can change over time. Reading is complex, so it is unlikely that children will only ever experience difficulty in one specific area. Educators should prioritise a child's need and provide additional support where they feel progress will have the most impact on other components or factors. For example, educators supporting children who have both decoding and fluency difficulties may prioritise decoding skills initially as this will ultimately impact on reading fluency once a child's decoding skills are further developed. All forms of assessment should support us to better understand the progress and needs of our learners. Educators often have a range of assessment opportunities and information at their fingertips to build a comprehensive picture of children's needs. Before choosing an intervention, 
it is important to triangulate various types of data, including notes from ongoing observation, feedback from children, and assessment scores. Triangulation involves using a range of information gathered from different assessment opportunities. Relying on just one type of assessment alone will not provide enough insight into a child's reading needs. Formative assessment occurs daily as educators observe and interact with children to notice progress and plan next steps. Summative assessment, such as standardised tests like SNSAs or end-of-level assessments, provide a snapshot of reading strengths and needs at a specific time. Diagnostic assessment helps identify what a child can and can't yet do, and therefore the nature of their needs. Diagnostic assessment may take the form of observation or may involve assessing specific skills, for example fluency or decoding. It is important that educators are mindful of the nature of the assessment used. A child's performance in assessment will depend on their reading abilities or skills, as well as their prior knowledge and the features of the text. Reading also involves many different components, so one type of assessment, for example a standardised test, will not assess all areas of reading in one go. Therefore, a variety of data sources is needed to decide a child's needs. Finally, we should also consider underlying factors that influence a child's reading assessment, such as their oral language skills or potential health difficulties. This Venn diagram illustrates how a variety of overlapping and interconnected assessments support us in selecting the most suitable intervention. When more than one of these assessments consistently tells us that a child needs support, it is then time to consider an appropriate intervention. Let's now go on to consider potential barriers to reading and associated behaviours we may observe through assessment. The list of barriers on the slide is not exhaustive, and as mentioned already, children may have difficulties in more than one area. Phonological and comprehension difficulties will be explored in more depth over the next two slides. As explored in The Importance of Oral Language for Reading video, the development of oral language underpins later reading progress. Difficulties in developing oral language skills can impact on reading as children need to understand and generate spoken text before we can expect them to do this with written text. Studies have found that difficulties in reading comprehension can be predated by difficulties in oral language skills. Sensory impairments such as hearing or sight can greatly impact reading progress. For instance, a child with a hearing impairment may struggle with auditory discrimination, making it hard to distinguish between sounds. Similarly, a child with a visual impairment may find it challenging to follow text on a page due to difficulties in visually discriminating between graphemes or letter shapes. Decoding difficulties may occur when children struggle to recall letter sound correspondences and use them to blend or segment words. Working memory is the system in our brains responsible for temporarily storing information and using this information in your thinking. Auditory memory is the ability to take in information you hear, process it, retain it, and then recall it. Visual memory is the ability to remember visual detail. Children rely on processing, storing, and recalling auditory and visual information when learning to read. Therefore, working memory difficulties can impact on a child's reading progress. Attention or concentration difficulties can also act as barriers to learning to read, as children need to focus their attention in order to carry out multiple processes at once, for example, decoding words, maintaining fluency, and understanding what they read. Reading difficulties can be further exacerbated where children feel demotivated or disengaged with the process of reading. It could be that the child is disengaged with the activity of reading rather than struggling with the process of reading itself. We need to reflect upon the experiences and environment that we are offering. Does the reading environment align with children's prior experiences or interests? 
Do children see purpose in the reading they are asked to do? Does the child's prior reading experiences align with what they are being asked to do in a school or setting? It could be the case that a child has missed a period of school or English is not spoken in their home, so children lack confidence or do not find the process of learning to read useful or relevant to their lives. Some children may struggle with reading due to limited exposure to text. Interventions could end up widening the experience gap if children end up reading less than their peers because they are taken out of class. Further details on these potential barriers as well as suggested supports and strategies can be found in the Addressing Dyslexia Scotland Reading Circles document linked in the signposting section of this resource. Phonological difficulties may be observed by educators in different ways. Be mindful that children will not necessarily present all of these difficulties, nor is this an exhaustive list. You might observe children reading inaccurately in a slow and laboured way. They may have difficulty in identifying, manipulating or generating chunks or units within words, for example, syllables and rhyme. Children may also struggle with phonemic manipulation, that is hearing and manipulating individual sounds and words. Quickly naming a series of known objects or verbal short-term memory tasks, for example, remembering a short sequence of numbers, may also be challenging. Any of the behaviours may be a sign of phonological difficulties. More detailed information on this area can be found in the Developing Phonological Awareness and Developing Phonemic Awareness sections of the resource. The ultimate goal of reading is comprehension which is the ability to understand what is read. Some children will decode words with ease, but have difficulty in taking meaning from individual words, sentences or the text as a whole. At word level, children may mispronounce or inaccurately read words due to limited vocabulary or knowledge of grammar. Mispronunciations or inaccuracies indicate that a reader is not monitoring their own understanding as they progress through a text. At sentence level, a child may struggle to connect what they have read with their prior knowledge or with clues in the text needed to make inferences. At text level, children may find it challenging to grasp the overall message or purpose of a text if they have limited experience with different text types or the intended audience. As explored in the Building Knowledge of the Child as a Reader video, developing understanding of a child's needs and barriers relies upon partnerships with colleagues and families and most importantly children themselves. This is particularly relevant in the context of interventions, where partnerships with children and their families should support them to feel the process is being done with them rather than to them. Educators might feel pressured to put children in intervention groups following a recent dip in attainment. Cameron Natal explains that this approach can harm parent-school relationships and undermine teacher agency when a results-driven agenda conflicts with inclusive practices. Cameron goes on to say that recent calls for children to catch up places additional pressure on schools and approaches to working with parents. Children should be part of discussions around intervention. Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, UNCRC, states that when adults make decisions affecting children, children have the right to express their views and have their opinions considered. This can be achieved through dialogue with children, allowing them to share where they feel their strengths in reading lie, identify areas where they need extra support, and discuss what this support may look like. In early 2024, the UNCRC was incorporated into Scots law. Many of the 42 articles closely link to the theme of collaboration and partnerships among all those involved in supporting a child's education. The General Teaching Council for Scotland's professional standards also outline the right of all learners to be included in decisions regarding their learning experiences within the professional value of social justice. Recognising parents and carers as the first and ongoing educators of their own children 
is key to valuing the knowledge they have of their child at home as well as in school or settings. They can provide personal insight into how children engage in reading practices at home and may also be able to support with key learning covered within interventions through follow-up support at home where appropriate. Speech and language colleagues, as well as other specialists, can provide helpful information or insight where factors are impeding a child's progress in reading, such as hearing, sight or speech. Psychologists or allied health professionals may be involved where an assessment of identified needs has to be completed. It is also imperative that the class teacher or support staff who work with a child on a regular basis are part of the process of planning, delivering and evaluating interventions. In some cases, children may be extracted from class to participate in an intervention which the class teacher or educator is not directly involved in. The EEF's Literacy in Key Stage 1 guidance report recommends that any school or setting considering delivering an intervention should ensure that they make connections between the out-of-class intervention learning and classroom teaching. Ensure decisions around chosen interventions are informed by research or evidence and appropriate to your school context. We know that interventions are more likely to be successful where they are based on a strong research or evidence base, as well as being appropriate to the school context and the individual child. As explored in the earlier Building Knowledge of the Child as a Reader video, knowing and understanding children and their reading profiles is important in choosing effective targeted interventions. The Strathclyde Three Domain Model offers three lenses which allow educators to reflect on literacy teaching and assessment and consider a child's reading profile. All domains are important because research shows that all three are highly impactful on literacy learning. Educators are encouraged to reflect on a child's cognitive skills and knowledge, such as decoding and fluency, alongside their cultural and social capital and their reading identity and motivation. If, for example, we don't take into account what reading material or text types children find valuable or provide content relevant to their lives, it's unlikely that we will successfully raise engagement. More details on the three domains model can be found in the Building Knowledge of the Child as a Reader video. The model is a useful tool to reflect upon when considering intervention. If we are to think beyond barriers to reading progress as only those which fall within the cognitive, knowledge and skills lens. A child's wider reading profile should be taken into account by an educator when assessing reading progress and identifying barriers. Let's now return to the key message, ensure decisions around chosen interventions are informed by research or evidence and appropriate to your school context. In the context of this resource, we describe a research or evidence-informed intervention as one in which the pedagogical approaches adopted are based on high-quality research or evidence. In some cases, schools may buy into commercial interventions. In other cases, educators may use interventions which have been developed or adapted at local authority level to take account of existing approaches. Our decision to implement a particular intervention may be based on data gathered from a research study. However, we may also use school-based evidence from practical experience or local level data. When a study has been conducted to determine the effectiveness of an approach or pedagogy, the International Literacy Association recommends that we consider how closely the context of the study matches that of our school or setting. Although it is highly unlikely that the population of the learners or the school context will be the same as your own, take time to reflect with colleagues whether the content and format is appropriate to the age and group of children who will be involved. This will also support buy-in from those involved. You should also reflect on the resource required for the intervention to be implemented as intended. 
consider the capacity of the team who will support the intervention. For example, an intervention which relies on regular intensive training to ensure its success is most likely not suitable for a school with limited time or support for ongoing training. Similarly, an intervention which relies on daily input would not be a good fit for a school which only has capacity for two sessions a week. A range of organisations, including the Education Endowment Foundation, have developed lists of evidence-based approaches or interventions which summarise average impact according to their own evaluations. Links to toolkits of this type can be found in the accompanying signposting section. Keep in mind that interventions, such as those listed in toolkits, should be considered as part of a broader suite of support. There is no one-size-fits-all or catch-all intervention. Reading is complex, so a single intervention is unlikely to address all of a child's reading needs, which are also likely to change over time. The chosen intervention should address the child's specific needs to prevent them from engaging in interventions that are not well matched to their individual requirements. There is, of course, no guarantee that an intervention which worked well before or within a research study will work in the same way again due to the complex nature of reading difficulties and the individual context of each child or group undertaking an intervention. We can, however, increase the likelihood of success by getting the implementation right. This links to the next and final section of the video in which we explore the factors which must be considered to increase the chances of success. Understand the purpose of a chosen intervention, how to implement it effectively and evaluate its impact. The final section of this video will consider the factors which support successful planning, delivery and evaluation of interventions. Once a child's strengths and needs have been identified and a suitable intervention chosen, those involved in implementing the intervention must now consider planning to ensure the greatest likelihood of success. The EEF described the success of any intervention as dependent on the foundations on which it is built upon. It needs leaders who actively support and manage the overall planning, resourcing, delivery, monitoring and refinement of an implementation process, as well as a climate which is conducive to change. An intervention needs to be well thought out and communicated with all those involved to avoid it being launched and later forgotten. It can be useful to decide upon a key member or members of staff who will oversee the planning, resourcing, delivery, monitoring and tweaking of the intervention. In addition to deciding who will lead the intervention, it may also be useful to reflect upon and discuss the following questions when moving to the planning and delivery stages. The Bradford Research School suggests beginning by agreeing upon or clarifying key principles or non-negotiables, which mean the intervention is likely to be carried out with fidelity. Which elements of the programme or approach must remain the same and why? If parts need to be scaled up or down to fit the context, what will these be? To ensure a climate where both children and those implementing the intervention feel purposeful and motivated, ensure that all those involved are aware of the purpose and aims. Where the aims are longer term, it may be helpful to set clear and achievable short term wins. This might be achieved by breaking long term aims or targets into more measurable and manageable targets. What will the child be able to do? How much? By when? Take time to consider the number of children involved in the intervention. The EEF found that on average, the smaller the group, the greater the impact. Groups of two have slightly higher impact than groups of three, but slightly lower impact compared with one-to-one -one tuition. How often will the intervention take place? Where the intensity of the intervention is not specified, the EEF suggests brief, about 15 to 45 minutes, and regular, three to five times per week, sessions that are maintained over a sustained period, 
8 to 20 weeks and carefully timetabled to enable consistent delivery. This is supported by Rohrer, who explains the principle of spaced practice, where learning is spread out over time to help us to learn effectively. This means we are more likely to learn a new skill if we practice it three times a day for five minutes instead of having one 15-minute block. Where will the intervention take place? Is there an allocated space where members of the group will be able to meet without being disturbed? As discussed at the beginning of the video, we also need to consider what children will miss out on as a result of joining in with intervention work. If the work is seen as a punishment by the child, or the child feels they are missing out on something they enjoy, engagement levels are likely to drop, and this could result in children not participating fully. The EEF describe a common element of the most effective intervention programmes as ones in which the support is explicitly linked with day-to-day -day lessons and connections are made between intervention and classroom teaching. The International Literacy Association recommends scheduling time for conversation and collaboration between the class teacher or educator and the person delivering the intervention. These conversations will provide opportunities for reflection and feedback on the delivery of the intervention. Providing training is another crucial element of ongoing planning and monitoring, which must take place before intervention delivery, as well as during and following the intervention to ensure sustainability. The Bradford Research School suggests ongoing training as the intervention progresses, as it is only once delivery has started that some opportunities for development and improvement are identified. Training should also, where possible, extend beyond the initial person or people who deliver the intervention to ensure sustainability where staff change or move on. The Bradford School of Research advised that the successful running of the intervention should not rely on one person as their expertise, contacts, drive and materials may be lost if they leave or move on. Training should in fact be ongoing as it is inevitable that staff will leave and new staff will join who have not yet taken part in initial training. A process for monitoring and reviewing progress is essential for evaluating the impact of an intervention. A timetable for reviewing progress should be agreed and all those involved, including the child and their family, should be clear about the aims and targets or outcomes. These reviews provide the opportunity for those involved in the intervention work to make adjustments. These adjustments may take different forms, for example modifying the time, number of sessions, the pace, opportunities for revision, the group size or possibly even the content itself where those delivering the intervention have developed a more detailed understanding of a group's needs. It is easy to fall into the trap of collecting data instead of analysing data to inform next steps. Although some interventions will require or suggest a pre- and post-intervention assessment to measure progress, this style of assessment does not allow us to reflect on when progress was made, what caused the progress to take place, or if the progress of the pupils would have happened regardless of intervention. Those delivering an intervention need to identify what progress will look like and how this will be regularly measured. Regular monitoring of progress through formative assessment and reflective conversations with those involved will also allow adjustments to be made throughout. Quantifying the progress of a child participating in an intervention can be challenging, particularly when considering aspects such as the impact on their motivation and attitude towards reading or family members' perceptions of their child's confidence and engagement in reading. Therefore, we cannot rely solely on quantitative feedback. That is data that can be counted, measured or given a numerical value. It may be more appropriate to measure progress using qualitative data, such as feedback from children, their families and their educators in the form of comments, notes or observations of improved engagement or enjoyment of reading activities. Such reminds us that there may be cases where we need to be more flexible around measuring the success of an intervention. 
he explains that the target of every intervention should be to maximise the outcomes for children while keeping paperwork to a reasonable level. This sometimes means being flexible on measurable outcomes and showing faith in the judgment of teachers or educators. In short, successful planning, delivery and evaluation of interventions relies on considering and acting upon a range of factors to maximise children's progress. A video overview, glossary, signposted resources and some reflective questions have been created to accompany this video. You can use the QR code on the screen to access these.